so I'd like to do some disclosures first. I have participated in a bluegrass vascular technology ID study in the US, uh, the trial for the surface or device. And um, I have a, uh, a consulting agreement with the vascular technology bluegrass, um, but I have not received any compensation up to, uh, until today. So hemodialysis access is, uh, is a big bulk of uh, our practice in vascular surgery, but also it's, uh, some general surgeons are involved in, in uh, dialysis access. Uh, just performing permanent access procedures uh, associated with significant preoperative morbidity and mortality that underscores how sick our patients are and how many comorbidities they have. Maintaining effective hemodialysis access is a lifelong challenge. Uh, patients keep coming back with uh, multiple problems with dialysis uh, uh, access issues and require multiple interventions. And that requires a lot of committed providers to keep uh, working on this on these problems. Number of uh, ESRD patients in the US uh, has been increasing and about 21,000 patients per year uh, are being added to the system and to the healthcare costs. Medicare fee for service spending for the dialysis patients increased by 1.6% from 30.4 billion in 2012 to 30.9 billion in 2013. And that accounts for 7% 7, 7 increase uh, in the uh, Medicare overall, overall claims. Most of the costs that happened, uh, happened during transition from uh, chronic kidney disease to the end stage renal disease when patients require dialysis. Uh, the costs are um, due to different reasons and the high use of long-term catheters was, is, has a big impact on these costs. Uh, frequent hospitalizations for permanent AV access failures uh, requires thrombectomies and revisions and uh, repeated access placement and uh, revisions that uh, contributes a lot to the cost. Quickly, we'll go through the uh, normal uh, AV fistula access that we perform every day, um, the simple ones. Um, we have the rule of two and three. Two is two millimeter damper for the RE and three millimeter damper for the vein to choose to perform our AV axis. And the rule is to start distal in the hand and the forearm and march up all, uh, all the way to the proximal upper arm. This is the one of the primary or the first procedures performed with the uh, dually uh, snout box uh, AV fistula uh, with the posterior branch of the radial artery. And we can march higher to the above the rest to the cephalic vein and the radial artery perform a radiocephalic AV fistula. Then we can go in the forearm, perform a radio to a proximal AV graft, uh, or as some providers pre prefer to uh, go to a venous axis in the upper arm and perform like a brachiocephalic or median endocrine vein to, uh, to brachial uh, AV fistula. Some um, providers prefer to stay in the forearm and perform a loop graft between the brachial artery or the proximal radial artery to the, um, to the uh, proximal veins. Uh, and others uh, provide also or prefer to uh, convert a radiocephalic fistula to a forearm loop using what we call the Oaks graft, which is uh, popular here in our uh, county hospital. Uh, this is, was kind of thought of by uh, Dr. Oaks, who is, uh, was a general surgeon in the past here in, in our uh, institution. And basically, you change the inflow from the, break, from the radial artery to the brachial artery and form a loop graft in the, in the forearm and now preserve the cephalic vein and add to it a piece of, uh, uh, of PTFE or artery graft or prosthetic graft. Then we move higher on the arm to the basilic vein and basilic vein transposition is a very common procedure and the patency is pretty uh, great, uh, very great for those uh, fistulas. Some people perform this in one stage or two stages. Then we move to AV graft between the brachial artery and the axillary vein and we can use uh, multiple uh, prosthetics, uh, different prosthetics, or we can use a vein from from the leg or a femoral vein if uh, the patient has high chance of infection. Basilic vein can also uh, be harvested along its entirety in the upper arm 
and then anastomosis brachial artery, and that's the most common practice. Uh, one of my partners, Dr. Stroy, just performed a procedure of basilic vein transposition in the forearm and to the radial artery, and he now we will have a long uh, basilic vein for access for dialysis. Other providers that sometimes harvest the basilic vein with endoscopic technique and then do the uh, anastomosis of brachial artery. When things become complicated in the upper arm and then we have central venous issues, uh, some providers move to the thigh and there are different configurations of performing AV grafts uh, or AV fissures in the, in the thigh. Uh, we'll go uh, through them really quick. Um, you can go up the, the common femoral artery or superficial femoral artery to the deep femoral system or to the great softness system. And uh, you can use multiple grafts or uh, you can use a superficial femoral vein as well. Med thigh loop AV axis is very uh, popular uh, because it uh, has a low chance of infection. It's away from the groin and it's in the mid thigh and it's between the femoral artery and the femoral vein. Femoral pain tr uh, transposition also in patients with high risk for infection is an, is an option uh, using the deep femoral vein and anastomosis to the uh, femoral artery and superficialize it at the same time. When all fails and things become more complicated, if we still have a central venous uh, uh, like outflow, we can perform a chest uh, AV graft between the uh, subclavian artery and the subclavian vein. Uh, and that's, uh, that's very advanced. We rarely do that. Last resort for patients who have no other options, it could be uh, arterial arterial uh, procedure, would basically do a loop graft uh, after transecting the artery uh, like this in the, on the chest or uh, in the thigh. Now we'll shift gears to central venous catheters, which is uh, very popular and uh, many patients come in and their first dialysis axis will be a central venous axis uh, through a catheter. Uh, in the US, about 5 million central venous catheters are placed and not just for hemodialysis, but for uh, administer fluids or antibiot antibiotics or nutrition. And the overall incidence of catheter-related venous complications is very significant, from thrombosis to sepsis to PE, uh, all the way up to death. And it's, uh, it's very considerable um, in, in their cost on the health system and on the patient care as well. In an autopsy study, the risk of venous thrombosis uh, with incannulated uh, veins versus non-cannulated veins range from 36% versus 1.6%, which is a very high number. So we can conclude that about 40% of patients with central venous catheters will have central venous stenosis of uh, one form uh, or shape. The catheter position in, is the most important factor. Um, it is recommended that we have the distal tip of the catheter in the, uh, at the junction of the right atrium and the superior vena cava. Uh, incidence of thrombosis or central venous uh, problems like occlusion or stenosis are higher if we insert these catheters on the left side rather on the right side. Uh, on the left side, the chances are about 25% of having the complication versus 6 or 7% uh, on the right side. So we definitely prefer to perform the catheters on the right side. Uh, C, uh, CIED, which is uh, cardiac implantable devices uh, like uh, pacemakers or ICDs, uh, also contribute to that uh, problem. Uh, if you look, uh, we have uh, about 10% of our dialysis patients uh, have uh, some sort of cardiac uh, implantable uh, device. About 10 to 64% of these patients will develop some sort of venous stenosis, and about 4 to 33% uh, almost will develop an occlusion of the central veins. So magnitude of catheters and um, uh, cardiac implantable devices are high. When we start having central venous uh, stenosis versus occlusions, the costs are going up. Um, if you have no occlusion, the cost will be uh, much lower as well as the quality of life and the morbidity of the patients are lower. But once we start having one occlusion or two or multiple occlusions, the cost and the quality, uh, cost increases and the quality of life uh, increases as well. So what's central venous occlusion or central venous stenosis? This is a patient, this is a chest picture and you can see 
on the right side, uh, the central veins are pretty much occluded on unopacified. This patient has some sort of stenosis here in the central vein. This patient uh, have uh, significant uh, stenosis here due to catheter. Uh, as long as we cross them with a wire, uh, the chance of doing a bone angioplasty is very good. And then we can uh, take care of the problem. There's a patient with um, ICD and he had a central venous stenosis and this is being ballooned. Um, after ballooning the central vein relatively goes back to close to a, a normal size. In our practice, we uh, recommend uh, for these patients to go uh, like uh, on a surveillance uh, angioplasty. They go every three, four months to IR and have some sort of balloon angioplasty. Some of them uh, go to procedure to have the procedures when they start, start having issues with the, uh, with the fistula before they occlude their fistula. This is a patient who has central uh, venous stenosis, uh, and he underwent a stent. Um, I apologize, the stent is not pro uh, projecting well. But we uh, we shy away from do doing any central venous stenting. Uh, there is a new evidence to, to prove that uh, drug eluding stents, uh, drug eluding balloons, uh, can perform much better than regular balloons, and the uh, the results are are better to the fact that he the patency as high as nine months without having any further intervention versus three to four months when you have a regular balloon. So stenting is not our practice and we, we kind of advise against it. Since we moved, since we started practice here six years ago at the county hospital, uh, we've seen a significant uh, uh, proportion of our patients have central venous disease and central venous occlusions and, and stenosis. And you can, these are pictures for our patients. This patient has an IJ occlusion. This patient has a left subclavian or a vein occlusion uh, or stenosis. This patient has a left uh, subclavian uh, vein uh, occlusion with a cephalic fistula that is about to occlude as well. You can see some of our patients have multiple devices, they have catheters and ICD wires. This patient have wires. This patient have an ICD and a catheter on the other side. This patient have less left central venous occlusion, um, and this patient have a central venous stenosis. All these are part of our patient's population here at the county hospital. So we realize we have a significant problem with our with with this in our county practice. When they come in with occlusion, it can be very advanced. This patient has all these collaterals in the in the chest wall, and uh, Basically, that forbids any uh, AV axis or AV graft on the right upper extremity. This is on, on the right as well. And you can see all these collaterals showing how significant uh, the occlusion uh, is and how long-term it is as well. This patient has bilateral centers, uh, central venous occlusion. As you can see from this picture, this patient lost all the uh, options of having axis on the right or on the left upper extremity. This is more advanced patient who have all these chest collaterals on the chest wall and lumbar in the back as well. And pretty much his IVC itself is occluded. So the, Soci the Society for Interventional Radiology uh, classified the central venous occlusion into four types. Uh, and when it includes the IJ or subclavian or bilateral IJs is type one. When it starts involving the right and nominate, uh, that's type two. When it starts going to the cephalic part of the uh, superior vena cava or bilateral anomaly occlusion, that's type three, uh, and that's above the azagous takeoff. And when it, it becomes more proximal in SVC, um, and that's below the azagous takeoff, that's the type four. That brought out the inside out concept, which uh, has been implemented by uh, uh, some cardiologists and interventional uh, physicians in the country. One of them I know myself is Dr. Gurley in University of Kentucky. And the inside out concept means that you go from the femoral vein through the IVC, uh, through the SVC to the occluded site and attempt recanalization or pretty much creating a channel outside of the, the outside of the vessel location, which is pretty much a tract, not intravascular, it's pretty much subcutaneous 
and bring in the wire outside the patients uh, on the on the on the right side of the neck, and that will create a, a body floss technique, and you can advance a catheter uh, through the uh, through the right neck. He uses off-the-shelf devices, um, including some um, some devices used for tips procedure, and uh, uh, he sharpened a, the back of 018 wire uh, with a sharpener and used that to puncture through the occluded site. The anatomical basis for the inside out axis, uh, basically, uh, if we look at this AP view, if, if we come in from the femoral artery going through the IVC, the SVC, and the innominate vein, and we go up, that's where the IJ is. If you have a uh, lateral view, we can see that's the trajectory of the wire or the device that would go in. And this is a clavicle, our landmark. And uh, that's a trajectory. Once it goes above the clavicle, and even if you puncture subcutaneous behind the clavicle, we are in a, in a territory that's very safe because the arteries and all the other structures are posterior and medial. And once you go above the clavicle, we can puncture through that and come out. And that's why we can create the channel between the outside and the inside. The cross section is very uh, descriptive too. This is a cross section and this is anterior, this is posterior. And once we get inside, this is an nominate vein, if you will, the subclavian vein. Uh, you can consider this maybe the IJ if it's open or occluded. And once you're above the clavicle or in a safe territory, there is nothing between the vein and the outside except the subcutaneous tissue and the muscle and the skin layers. So if you go medial, there are dangerous structures. If you go posterior, there are dangerous structures. If you go uh, pretty much posterior or medial, these are the territories that you don't want to go into. So in his early experience, um, I think that was about 10 years ago, but they are uh, doing another study soon. Um, for the four types, he was able to recanalize all the four types, except about 2.6% of patients that he was not able to perform the procedure. And I think that the cohort in this uh, study was about 120 patients or so. And he was successful in almost 98% uh, of patients. Again, that's when he comes from the femoral vein all the way up through the uh, SVC. And then once you, you head behind the clavicle, you're pretty much uh, into the occluded segment and go above the clavicle. And that's when you start going higher subcutaneous. And that's when he punctures through the skin and brings the wire out. And that's, a con that's where the concept of the surface art device came, which has been used in Europe for, since 26, uh, 2016, but it's been trialed in the US between 2017 and 2019. And our center was part of this trial. Uh, we performed six patients. Um, basically, we restore access when the central veins are occluded. And that the device can be used by uh, IR uh, personnel, physicians, and vascular surgeons, and IR nephrologists and cardiologists. Uh, the, the benefit of creating that channel or placing a catheter in uh, patients with occluded central veins, you can use that mainly for dialysis if we, if we have to, and also some patients with chemotherapy or nutrition or uh, can have PCR wires as well. This is a quick view of the handle of the, of the uh, device. It's pretty simple and uh, pretty much this is the, uh, the wheel that rolls when, it, when you start wheeling they're all from the red, which is the, I'm sorry, from the green, which was um, safe to red, is which is uh, unsafe. Uh, that's when the this wire, this needle guide wire comes out. It, it's a hollow needle. And then once you unlock this handle and start pumping the, the, um, the, the pumper, if you will, uh, or the plunger, uh, the wire that is attached or in, uh, attached in the device it starts uh, coming out uh, the and the needle guide and the needle wire starts puncturing through the the tissue that's going through, and this is very sharp uh, needle. Pretty much, uh, you can hurt your finger with it. I'm going to show a quick demo of the device itself and how it uh, how it works. I'm going to unshare and share the screen. The Surfacer Inside-Out Access Catheter System 
is a novel approach to gaining Venus access from the inside out. The operator navigates the surfacer from the femoral vein and exits via the venous vasculature. A sheath is advanced over an O35 guide wire to the venous obstruction. It is the conduit for all instruments used during the procedure. After a target is placed on the exit area, the device is advanced into the obstruction. Fluoro is adjusted until the tip of the device is visible within the exit target. The device handle is rotated until the target window appears and the needle guide is advanced out of the tip. The occlusion acts as a stabilizer as the needle wire pierces the skin at the predetermined exit point. The operator then inserts a sheath from the outside in. The surfacer is removed and a central venous catheter or dialysis catheter is placed using standard access procedures. So I was telling presentation mode. Okay. Okay. So that's pretty much how the device uh, goes inside the patient and comes yeah. out. Okay. Uh, so uh, quickly, we'll go through the types of the occlusion that we have. Uh, this is the angiogram. All these are patients that we have done uh, here. Uh, this is the uh, right anomalous vein, and uh, the IG is occluded. Subclavian has a stump here, and that's type one. Pretty much when you have the anomalous still patent. Type two when you have the, the anomalous still uh, patent. I'm sorry. Let's keep going, Ian. Yeah. Uh, the anomalous uh, patent and. Uh, uh, but it's occluded uh, distally, and that's type two, and you still have the IVC uh, intact and patent. You'll see the same, uh, same on this side as well. Type three, when you have occluded a nominate and uh, cephalic uh, uh, superior vena cava, and those, those uh, are pretty much the hardest of the, of the four types. Type four, when you have the uh, superior vena cava occluded above uh, in its entirety, and it's hard to see, the uh, the uh, SVC atrial junction, and you don't even see the azygous and the, all the uh, contrast refluxes through the uh, uh, right atrium and back to the pulmonary uh, pulmonary veins. So the concept that we use, or that devices use, is to stay anterior and lateral. Those are the safest places. The this is a lateral view, and this is a lateral view as well. This is anterior and this is posterior. As long as the wire and the catheter on all the devices go in anterior and you have the head of the clavicle as your landmark, we are in the safe place. If, if the wire or the catheter go posterior, that's where the azygous uh, is present. And that's when you start redirecting our uh, devices, our wires and our catheters to go more anterior and uh, go to the appropriate location. Again, this is the azygous and the superior vena cava. You can see the head of the clavicle. And this is the wrong direction. You don't want to go this way, but we want to go that way. And once we get to the uh, the part of the occluded segment, blunt dissection is okay as long as we are going anterior toward the head of the clavicle, and also uh, we make sure we go in lateral with the AP view. So that the device is inserted through the uh, the sheet that comes with it uh, through the iliac vein, and that's the first step, and then. Uh, goes all the way to the occluded segment. And this is an AP view. And we can see the head of the clavicle and you can see the device going slightly lateral. And this is a nubbing or the tract that we need to use so we can advance our device through that. This is, uh, again, that's when we start angulating the IR to 30 degrees uh, RAO to make sure that we're going anterior. We're not going posterior toward the azimuth vein. Then a device been advanced uh, through the occluded segment. And once the, the needle, the, uh, the eye of the needle comes above the clavicle, that's when we start orienting our device. And again, as you can see, it's going lateral to the head of the clavicle. And with the lateral view, you can see it going anterior. 
once we get to this area, we have a washer that we put outside the patient and that will give us a direction exactly where we want the wire out or around this location. We adjust our II cephalad uh, pretty much from cranial to caudal and then uh, uh, REO as well. And that will align the washer uh, with the eye of the needle here. So that will give us a direction how, uh, what's the angle that we need to, uh, to use to advance this needle guide right there, which we saw on the device. And once we uh, decide what the angle, we advance a needle guide uh, with the handle to that angle. And that's when we start deploying our wire with using a plunger, the wire will come out of the needle at the needle wire and then starts functioning through the scan. You can miss the washer, but we are in the same vicinity or in the vicinity or the territory of that washer. That's when the wire comes out and you can catch it with the, with the hemostat outside the patient. If the wire starts uh, going under the skin, not going the right direction, that's pretty much subcutaneous. That's when we can pull the wire back and that uh, we can be adjusted and we can redeploy it. So that's not usually not an issue. Some in the in initial uh, in the beginning of our experience, we used to advance once we had the inside out uh, track created. We used to advance like a four French sheet, and um, and inject some uh, contrast to make sure that we didn't uh, we don't have any significant bleeding or issues. Uh, we never had that, but that's a demonstration of how it works. Once we have the uh, the body floss created, now we advance our sheet as we can see here and it goes inside. So it's from the outside to the inside. And that's when we disconnect everything and we advance the um, introducers to the uh, dialysis catheter. The device is very simple to use. Um, and this is my six-year-old daughter and she is uh, playing with it uh, in a safe location. And she uh, learned how to do this easy. So she uh, undo the uh, needle wire that comes out, as you can see. That you know how to unlock the safe uh, the safety mechanism and use a plunger, and the wire comes out. And then, if she has an issue with the wire, she pulls it back, and the end the end as well. And if you wanna unsheath that needle wire, she rolls it back and lock the system, and you can take it out of the patient. So what are the issues that we encounter? Uh, yes. What are the issues that we encounter, encounter during this uh, uh, procedure? If we have a stenotic IVC or iliac veins, uh, that will be a significant issue uh, because it, we need an access to get to the occluded segment. So uh, one of our patients, we, we balloon the whole entire IVC uh, to be able to get through, to get up there to perform the procedure. If we have a right subclavian stent, that's one of our patients, we tried to cannulate twice. Uh, the first time we could not go through the stent or around the stent, uh, but the second time we tried, it, we did. But the problem with that patient that we could not go through the iliac vein and that procedure was aborted. aborted. Also remember the azygous is uh, your friend, but also can you be our enemy because we don't wanna go posterior. That's all the important structures are. So always remember, to go anterior, and that's a lateral view, as we can see here. If we don't have a uh, significant knobbing here or a track that we can use to advance a device, that's another issue. Uh, until today, we still uh, like to create a small channel in the occluded vein before we advance a device, but I believe the device will, uh, by itself, will create a track. As our experience more becomes more uh, advanced, we'll be able to do that. And this is one of the issues that we encountered during the trial and uh, during practice. The device, when it goes through the iliac vein, sometimes kinks the sheet. The device is very stiff and the shaft is not, is not of course, not flexible. So sometimes uh, because of the iliac uh, tushwasti, about two of our patients were abandoned because of this, uh, this issue. So the, the device has been, uh, uh, studied in Europe extensively and in the US, uh, our the IDE study that, that was performed uh, until uh, 
beginning of 2020 or end of 2019. Um, there were about six centers in the US and uh, we they included 30 patients and the 30 patients, uh, uh, 27, 27 out of the 30 patients uh, were successful and the other three patients uh, uh, were, not, were not successful due to tortuosity of the, of the axis. Also, the, um, the, the device was trialed extensively in Europe uh, and they, are, they have their own data as well. This is European uh, experience and they have 30 patients as well. And the success rate was uh, pretty much more than 97%. They have 30 patients, 29 was, were successful. There was no, uh, uh, no complications from the device itself. And they have the four types of the occlusion. Uh, most of the types they treated with uh, was type four and type uh, type one and type uh, type three. I think they have a good distribution as well uh, of the types of the occlusion. This is a U.S. Uh, trial that we were involved in, and we had thirty. They had thirty patients. Um, the main bulk of the um, of the occlusion type was type three, and um, they were uh, the success rate was uh, ninety percent. Uh, as I said, twenty-seven patients out of thirty uh, were successful. This is pretty much a collective uh, collective review of the um, the two trials that I mentioned, uh, as well as a field uh, evaluations that were done in Europe of one hundred twenty one hundred ten patients. There are almost more than two hundred patients done uh, um, worldwide so far. So. Uh, the things I want to point here, the success rate of above 90%, as well as the uh, device-related adverse events were zero. None of the, as long as we follow the uh, steps that we mentioned uh, during our conversation, uh, and we go uh, lateral and anterior, uh, the device will not cause harm, as, as far as we know so far. These adverse events that happened in the US trial was mainly some hematoma at the uh, catheter placement site, um, I believe so, and some sort of uh, a hypotension or hemodynamic instability of one patient unrelated to the device itself. Our uh, SV, uh, our VMC experience in our county uh, system, so far we had 16 patients or trialed 16 patients, uh, six of them during the trial and 10 after the trial and we had 14 were successful. Uh, the two unsuccessful cases were due to iliac tortuosity and we could not advance the device. And uh, most of our patients' uh, occlusion types were one and three. And three of those patients were exchanged to hero graft and we had no complications. Quickly, I wanna go through the indications for the device. Uh, basically, in the past, when we had uh, patients who required central venous catheter placement, we go for the, from the right IJ and introduce a catheter. And then uh, if we're unable to do so uh, because of the occluded IJ or occluded central, uh, central venous system on the right side, uh, we start going from the left uh, IJ or left subclavian to place the catheter. And the problem with that, that uh, compromises future access on that left side. And also, as we mentioned earlier, there's a higher chance of, of central venous stenosis or occlusion if we insert catheters on the left side compared to the right side. So the current practice that we have for that, based on that device and the availability of that device and our experience, that if we have someone who has right central venous occlusion and they require a catheter placement until they have a permanent or long-term dialysis access placed, uh, we recanalize the right side and place the catheter on the right side. That will give us an, uh, a chance. Number one, if the patient uh, require, uh, have no other options on the left, we can convert the uh, catheter on the right to a hero graft in the right upper extremity, and now he has an upper extremity AV graft. And also, if the patient is still having an axis on the left uh, upper extremity placed, and that will require about, about two or three months to have that axis ready for, uh, for use, we place the catheter on the right side using the, the surface serve uh, device. Also, the central venous axis uh, that we can obtain can also use for other patients, for patients who have central venous occlusion and require 
uh, required nutrition or required chemotherapy. Uh, none of our patients uh, were uh, that we have performed uh, required any of that, but uh, all our patients were for dialysis access. The other things, uh, two or three of our patients have femoral catheters because of central venous occlusion uh, of bilateral central veins, like in bilateral endowments. And we converted uh, this femoral catheter to a right upper arm hero graft uh, by using the surfacer. And then we, now they had an upper extremity or they had an upper extremity AV graft versus a lower extremity AV fissure or AV graft. So a quick comment on the, on the hero grafts. Um, basically, uh, this is kind of a last resort for patients with central venous stenosis or central venous occlusion. And it has two, two components, it's pretty much uh, brachial anastomosis with an AV graft, mainly PTFE. And there is a connector in the middle and there is a silicon part here, which is an outflow component that goes into the, uh, bit, to the junction between the right, uh, right atrium and the SVC. HERO stands for Hemodialysis Reliable Outflow. We have been using it in our uh, practice here to, due to the um, advanced disease that our patients have, uh, mainly central venous occlusions uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and as, a, as I mentioned, there is the outflow component and there is the PTFE component and there is a connector in between. Uh, the concept is basically that we are bypassing the central venous stenosis or occlusion and the patients don't have uh, pretty much their natural or uh, normal outflow through the central veins uh, that they can, uh, can rely on uh, on their own. Uh, these are the, some of the um, outcomes or uh, of the hero graft. Uh, mainly here what we found in our practice with the hero grafts we have, I think we've performed about 16, 17 of them, that they are the they have frequent thrombosis. They uh, pretty much uh, clot uh, very often, and the, the the issue with that is just the patient requires multiple uh, procedures and multiple interventions. But one of the good things that they actually declot or uh, we do thrombectomy very easy. Our radiologists are able to uh, take care of these very quickly. It takes them less than an hour to declot them. And most of the time, we cannot find a reason for that, for the clotting. Uh, so far, we have a, um, an idea that maybe the connector is a problem with those. And there, usually there is no arterial anastomotic issue and the outflow component usually is clear and has no issues as well. Uh, they also can uh, cause a steel, uh, AB fissure steel. We have not uh, seen that in our practice yet, but have seen it be uh, previously. And uh, also infection of the graft itself uh, which is like any other graphs um, that we perform. Thank you very much.